Welcome to Real Musicians Don't Starve. Today, I am with a friend of mine named Chris uh, Wallen, and here is the story with Chris. Uh, normally, I like to give a long list of, of credits that people have and, and the various guests that we have, and Chris has a very long list of credits. But the, the thing is, is that I feel like once I say Garth Brooks, I feel like I've said enough <laughs> because uh, Chris has had three cuts with Garth Brooks. He's also had you know, cuts with other artists, un- huge artists in the, in the country world, such as Kenny Chesney, uh, Montgomery Gentry, and many others, which I'm sure he's going to be sharing with us today. But really, once you say Garth Brooks, you, you kinda, it's kind of like, like he's like the Beatles of, of country music, right? Uh, Garth Brooks is actually the highest selling solo artist of all time. Uh, so Chris, what an incredible uh, privilege to have you here speaking with oh, us today. Oh, thank you so sharing, much. Sharing, uh, sharing your story uh, uh, with everyone and, and also the various strategies that I know you're gonna uh, you know, uh, grace, grace us with. Um, but I would love for you to give a, a quick, just a very brief uh, uh, bio because I think your story is, is very relatable. Um, and uh, I, I, just, I just love, love, right before we started recording, you know, we were talking about getting turned down and, and all the rejection oh, that we faced. So I, I love, you know, it, it's great to hear the success stories, but sometimes it's equally as great to hear the failures. Oh, yeah. And I have some of those. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for coming with us. And, and let's just dive right in. You know, uh, yeah. let's just talk quickly about the Garth Brooks stuff, because, you know, uh, you were telling me that you just got three, three new, uh, three new re- recordings with him. You recorded. Uh, I, got, well, I, I have uh, two new ones. I had three. I never had a Garth Brooks cut i had a bunch of holds from him over the years but um basically it's, it's kind of odd how it happened because uh, it was a weekend and he had had a song of mine on hold for a while for months and they called me it was like on a on a saturday and they uh, they said hey i just wanted to call and tell you that garth cut your song today and I was like, oh, my gosh, that's awesome. Finally, he cut that song. It's been on a hold forever. And they said, no, he didn't cut that song. I said, really? What song did he cut? So they said it was this other song. I said, oh, my gosh, I didn't even know he had that song. So uh, we were all celebrating. And and the next day, Sunday, I had some friends over. We were, you know, we were just hanging out. And I got another phone call and said, hey, Garth cut another one of your songs today. And I was like, did he cut the one that that was on hold? No, no, he didn't cut that one. He cut another song. And like I said, I've never had a Garth Brooks cut. And I was like, oh, my gosh. So what about the song that was on hold for so long that we haven't heard anything about that? So, well, hey. Who cares? I got two, got two songs. Well, about a month or so goes by and he cut the song that was on hold. So I ended up with three songs on Garth's album and, um, and, and, and the first single off the album, people loving people. And what was interesting about people loving people was when we wrote that song, uh, you know, we, we came in, uh, I was in a writing session and Lee Thomas Miller and, uh, Busby, the uh, writer Busby, LA writer. Yeah. And, I know Mike. I, I knew Mike when I yeah, moved to LA. Years yeah, ago. man. And we lost him not that yeah. long ago, but uh, great guy. Great guy. So, so we're all in writing, uh, you know, writing that day and we're talking about the, the state of music, the state of the world, the state, you know, and we all agreed that there was a cure for all of it, no matter what side you're on. And I still stand by this, but just people being decent, people loving people. So we end up writing this song. And as we were, I had forgotten this until Busby actually reminded me uh, later. He goes, you remember what you said when you w- was walking out the door? And we had just written a song, and I was walking out the door, and 
I turned around, I said, you know, I said, it's kind of bittersweet because I love this song. I love what it says. I love the message, but no one is saying this message anymore. I said, the only one that I hear doing this song is Garth Brooks and he's never coming out of retirement. (laughs) That's what I said. Yeah. So fast forward, like four years later, it's his first single off this, off his first record out in like seven years. You know, you know, the amazing thing about writing songs is, you know, oftentimes it's, it's not, there's not an immediate reward. Uh, you know, I, right. I, I, I always give, uh, and there's many songs I've written that sit for a while. Uh, but, but one in particular, which has been a theme song for a Saturday morning kids show now for nine years. Um, right. it, it got, it got picked up in, uh, in 2000 and, 11. So actually we're really coming up to a little later this year. It'll be 10 years that that show has right. been on the air, but that song was written in 2005. It sat, it sat for six years before it got picked up. I had one and, of those too. Yeah. And then now, now of course it's, it's great that once it gets picked up and then you have a long life with it, but you know, you, you just never know when that song uh, is going to do something. And same thing with, with, you know, with in the country market, you know, I know you have artists will, you know, hold the song, you know, put a song on right. hold for a little while, then maybe mm-hmm. they don't cut it. So then, you know, it sits for a little while, then it gets uh, put on hold by another artist for a little bit. But, you know, in, in the licensing world, the world that I live in, uh, in 2006 is actually August of 2006. A buddy of mine wrote a song as a theme song for a, a pilot. And, uh, and it got picked up as, as the theme song, but then the pilot did not get picked up as a show, right? So, mm, so the show was not right. produced um, after the pilot. And so that song, which was written specifically for that show as the theme song, uh, sat for nine years. It wasn't until 2015 or maybe even 2016. So it may, it may have been you know 10 years, but either way, it was a very long yeah. time before it got picked up for a theme song for a morning talk show. Um, oh, wow. And, and, and it's just one of those things where like, again, that track just sat for years and years. And again, I had, I had a happens. number one song. I had a number one song with Toby Keith that uh, sat for six years. Nobody, not even a hold. It never even got a hold. Yeah. And um, all within three months, well, probably six months, I got a phone call and said, Hey, Trace Atkins just cut your song. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's awesome. Finally, somebody cut that song. Never makes the album. <laughs> yeah. He, they, he cut it, but it never makes the album. So a month later, uh, a month goes by, says, um, hey, this new guy from RCA just cut your song. They said it changed the whole face of the album. We love it. It's going to be the first single. Well, it did change the whole face of the album because he lost his record deal two weeks later. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. So so a few months go by and I get a call. I said, hey, Toby Keith just cut your song. And I was real quiet. I said, well, we'll see. <laughs> you don't know the history and the devastation this song has, <laughs> has right. caused. It's, yeah. But it ended up being the number one record, you know, so uh, six years later. So it, it, you know, you just never know when you, when you make art, it's, yeah. you never know when it's going to rise. You know? and, and that's a, so, you know, obviously no matter what, you know, when you're in the music space, there's rejection. You know, one of the things I love about doing this <laughs> podcast is I get, I get to speak to a lot of successful musicians in various aspects of of uh, the music business and you know obviously the common bond is rejection there's you gotta no have way a thick it. skin so what are so what are what are some of the strategies that you've implemented in your own career you know to to push you through those times uh, of rejection you know where a song you know gets cut but then it doesn't you know make the record and obviously that's a that 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 hurts you know that that's a hit to you you know what, what would have been my first you? cut I, I got uh, I got used to it early because what would have been my first cut? They they said it was going to be this big you know the, this big thing. Like I said, it was going to be the title track, and uh, and ended up you know not 
not being cut, uh, not well, not making the album, and um, and it just devastated me, you know. But the thing about it is, is you have to realize that it's just you just go on to the next one. It, it, you can't. The only thing you can control is the song you're writing right now how you know and and it, it's more of a long game as far as how many quality songs or quality tracks that you have to to work for you in the future so you know uh, what your i always say future 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 success isn't something that happens tomorrow it's whatever you're doing right now Hey, I just want to jump in here for a second and let you know that if any of your goals over the next year include recording and releasing a new album, generating placements of your songs on TV shows and films, or just building a fan base that will sustain your music career, I want to invite you to my special workshop, Real Musicians Don't Starve. In this workshop, we are going to focus on the three keys to your success, and you're going to learn an extremely powerful strategy that allows you to create your own wow factor. This allows you to attract opportunities to you and your music, as well as remove any financial worry from your life. You can check out this workshop for free at realmusiciansdontstarve.com slash workshop. Now back to the podcast. I noticed behind you, uh, and it's, it's off in the distance, but I believe that's Kenny Chesney behind you, correct? It is. Yeah. It's a, a don't blink. I, I, I know a little bit about that song, and I would love for you to share the story that you have related to, to that particular song. Well, um, you know, that's one of those songs that I was so glad that that song hit because it, it, really, it really meant a lot to me because I'd had that idea for a year. I had thrown it out to a couple of people and they, they didn't bite on it. And, and I had lost three major family members just right in a row. I lost my mother, my brother, and my grandmother just bam, bam, bam. And, and it, you know, and I was messing with a song idea, uh, kind of, you know, my therapy, as uh, songwriters do. And I was writing with a, a buddy of mine, Casey Bethard, who has had many, many, hit songs. I was writing with him. I was writing for Warner brothers at the time. And he'd come in and he goes, I'm so sorry. I'm late. He said, man, I'm sorry. I'm late. He said, there was a motorcycle accident in front of my house. I was like, Oh my gosh, is everything okay? And he goes, well, he said, I, 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 I know the guy he couldn't have made it. Because, you know, he, he was going, you know, 100 miles an hour. And, it, and he was like, there's no way that he could have made it. And he goes, man, you just never know when it's your time. And, and I, I started, that prompted me telling him about my, you know, the people that I have lost and how, how you think you have time. And, and sometimes you don't. You think you're going to have, more, tomorrow isn't promised. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, I had this idea and we ended up writing it and both of us said Kenny. I mean, it was so obvious it was a Kenny song. Well, we took it to our publisher and everybody, everybody we talked to said, Kenny isn't looking for any ballads, no ballads. They said not even to pitch him a ballad. And all up tempos. And we were like just bummed out, you know, because we was, man, I know this is a Kenny song. It just sounds like a hit for him. So, so we wait for you know about a week, and then Casey kind of went above his his uh, plugger's head to the head of Sony, uh, and so he he said. I have this song. He called him. He says, I have this song. I need to play you. We have to get this to Kenny. And he goes, well, you know, Kenny's not cutting any ballots on this. And he goes, I know, but I, I, I would like for you to hear it. So he goes up and he plays it 
for Troy Tomlinson, the head of uh, Sony in Nashville. And he gets about halfway through it and he shakes his head and he's like, I have to call Buddy. I have to call Buddy. So Buddy Cannon, who for years has been a great friend of mine, I didn't really know him that well then, but uh, Buddy produces, has produced Kenny for 20 years. And, um, and he also produces Willie Nelson. <laughs> but um, So he calls Buddy and he says, hey, I have this song I want to send you. And Buddy, you know, Buddy's like, no ballads. Because I know this is a ballad, but you at least his words were, you at least need a chance to pass on this. So he sent it over to Buddy. And Buddy, and I still have such huge respect for Buddy Cannon for this because you don't hear about people doing this anymore. Buddy is also a songwriter has had many hit, uh, Vern Gosden hits, uh, you know, a great songwriter. So he took one of his own songs that he wrote that they were going to cut for the album and he took it off and put don't blink on there. Wow. And to this day, I have such huge respect for buddy because nobody does that. Yeah. If they if they have their own song on on a on a huge act that they're producing, it stays on there. And now, Buddy took it off for my song, and I'll I'll never forget that. Now, now the, this story exemplifies something that is so important and key in in general when it comes to just the music industry at large, no matter which aspect you're you're in, and that is the uh, importance and the power of having a team and a network. You know, I know that in, in, the, in right. the licensing world, you know, like I said, where I live, you know, a lot of people, they just want to, they just want to pitch their songs directly to, to supervisors and, and whatnot. And I'm always saying you have to have a team. You need to work with yeah. a library. You got to have a, a company that has a team, whether it's a, you know, a, 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 a sync rep or, or, or a publisher or, or a music library. You have to have a team because the team, there's so much power in that. And, and we hear this when we're inside the business over and over and over. We hear all these types of stories you know, from yeah. the writers and stuff like that of what it took for the songs to get placed. Yeah, you know, you're always going to hear that thing where like, you know, the artist was, you know, sitting at a coffee shop and then someone drove by and, and was playing one of their song demos in their car and the artist heard it and went up and wanted to cut it. I mean, th that's like a one in a million that shot. That never right? had. Yeah, that, that's like a, like that's hitting the lottery. It is hitting know? the musical lottery. <laughs> yeah. But, but this story is, is just one of many, 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 many examples of the power of a team. But the other thing I love about this particular story, and I'd love for you to continue on with it, is how you then submitted the song to a, to a, uh, <laughs> well, you, you continue with this because I yeah. love this part of the story. Well, the day that Kenny cut Don't Blink, the day that I heard that he cut Don't Blink, I, you know, that night I was at home, I was on my computer and there's this critique site that, you know, where, where you put, you, you submit your song and they, and people uh, all around uh, that, that are also members of the site critique it. And I just, I just, did, I thought, you know what, I'm going to just for the heck of it to see what people say. So I put up don't blink to be critiqued in the site. Well, and I'll be honest, it made some people, they found out it was me later on and people got mad. I, I did not do it to, to be, you know, mean spirited or any way or, but there is a uh, man, the critiques that it, they just got demolished. Actually, let's see if I still have, uh, I had it right here. I, I love, I, love the I think I got it the because note. it's such it's such a great example of like, you know, a lot of people spend a lot of money sending their songs into these songwriting competitions. And this this story is great because music is not a competition, right? Okay. And and this no. is I absolutely and I've been through this myself too. We won't tell my, my story now, but but I love this because this was a big song. 
you know? Well, I, wa- I wanted to, I have this, I actually wrote all these down that I use now when I, if I do seminars, right. I always uh, do, this is some of the, the high praise <laughs> that, that don't blink guy. Okay. The execution needs tightening. Your verses are a bit clunkily stated. Your second verse needs a verse second system advancement with details. It's more like course material. You have the basic idea. Now rework, refine, inner workings, and hone the details. It goes on down, but the last one is my favorite. I, I won't do all of them, but the last one is my favorite. This has some good potential with a major rewrite or 10. <laughs> I love okay. that. Okay, so fast forward, Don't Blink comes out. He gets his first review. Okay. The, uh, the, it's the first internet review, you know. Um, uh, the, the first review that I see on it, and I'm, I'm like, well, finally, maybe somebody will sit, you know, see what I saw in the song. This is my first review. They call me out directly. Okay. The lyrics of Don't Blink makes absolutely no sense. Otherwise, excellent songwriter Chris Wallen, writer of I'm Trying, Speed, Something to Be Proud of, and Love Me If You Can, could, of course, keep the hook line and use the rest of the lyric to explore what exactly the character in the song is saying. Instead, he simply says, Don't Blink and then runs through a series of unimaginative, unsubstantiated, and unrealistic examples of what the song is supposed to be about. I wish that more of Kenny's recent singles sounded like this, for the production and vocals are strong and reminiscent of the earlier material that won won in most of his fans. However, nothing can salvage such a terrible piece of songwriting. Now, now, what did that hit on the charts? Man, that's that just warms you up inside, don't it? Woo! What, what was what was the what was the the number that it hit on the chart? Okay. Oh, it, it was a six week number one. See, there you but, go. That's- okay, but here's here's the thing. I always uh, go to this one. Billboard magazine. I said, I always tell people. I said, this is this is what really counts. This new single, "Don't Blink," debuts. This is from Billboard magazine debuts in the billboard charts at number 16 equaling the highest debut of all time since the song my heart skips a beat by buck owens debuted at 16 the week of march 28 1964 i had i had that um i had that the record debut for one week and Garth Brooks come along and debuted at number one. <laughs> Unbelievable. So I, I, had, I had the record for a week. That Garth got me. <laughs> but, you know, the thing is, is that that just goes to show that, you know, I, I, I personally can't stand those, those things where you send in your music and people judge it. Music is not anything yeah. to be judged. It's, it's art, you know. And, and I love this story so much because it was such a massive song, but yet, Someone is going to tear it down and tell you all the things you need to change when the reality is that music is, it, it hits an emotion. Well, know? I think sometimes people too, and I always, I, I, I say, I, I said this in my uh, email that I use this, uh, this same video in of uh, telling the story about this song. Be, you know, make sure people are listening to the song and not who they think wrote the song. And that happens a lot where, you know, uh, a big songwriter can go up and and do this song and then someone else can go up that has never had anything going on and they can, they can sing a a better song than that person and nothing because, you know, when I used to do a solo, I did, I did a solo act before I moved to Nashville and, um, you know, I, I played in this country club, and they never would even barely listen to me. And they actually one time they turned they turned the football game on the TV behind me on <laughs> while I was playing. 
that's a big boost of confidence. Yeah. But <laughs> they, um, but they, I used to, when I play my own songs, I, I, I first I used to, I would tell them I wrote this song, but then I stopped doing that. I, then I started saying, Hey, this is Tim McGraw's new single that's coming out in a couple of weeks. And I would play the song and I would have people come up to me. Oh man, I can't wait to hear Tim sing that song. I love that song. And, you know, and, and it happened almost every time I would say that, but when I would say, Hey, here's a song I wrote, right. You know, some guy from East Tennessee, just sitting there with a guitar, nothing. They would start talking. But when I would put someone's name in front of it, you know, it, it's just amazing how that works. I used to, when I first came to town, I used to lie to people and tell them that I wrote more songs than what I did and that I had been to town longer than what I really had. Because I used to, uh, I used to play at this, at this writer's night. And every, every time I would tell them, I'd say, how many songs have you written? And I would tell them they're like, you're just a baby. Or you're just, you know, uh, or I would tell them that I'd only been to town for, you know, a like two years. Oh, you're just starting. You're just a baby. And when, when really, you know, I ended up a lot of those people who said that I ended up with a deal and some of them never really got anything going. And, uh, and it's not about, you hear people say, well, you know, you write, uh, you know, write a hundred songs and, and then throw them away. And that's where you start. Well, that's, that's so not, I hate when people say that because it's not about how many songs you write. If you, if people brag that they've written, um, you know, that they've written 500 songs and they can't play me one song, then they they need to fix something. You know, it, it, it's, they can't play me one song. That's like, wow. It isn't about how many songs that you have. It's about the quality of the songs that you can play someone. And, uh, and I think, you know, I just, you know, I see it online. I see these people saying speed songwriting, learn how to speed song. And that drives me crazy. I was like, you know what? Listen to country radio today. The last thing we need is people writing songs faster than what they are. <laughs> <laughs> it's because all, all the songs sound the same and they're following they're the exactly formula. they're using you know, the same getting, loop they're using it you know getting back to what you were saying uh you know about um yeah I, i've experienced it too where i've written songs and someone you know didn't really like it i was telling you the story earlier of how i took a couple songs to a publisher in nashville before i moved to la and they you know totally dismissed me this is the final time i was like yeah. if they dismiss me again then i'm done and I went to LA and those exact songs started getting placed. I came back to Nashville a couple of years later. I ended up meeting with one of those publishers again uh, with a friend of mine. And, uh, and I said, yeah, I said, I, I, you know, he, he, you know, I've gotten placements on these shows and stuff like that. And he wanted to listen. He wanted to hear those songs. Well, he had actually heard them before, you know, four years prior when I played them for him. So I played him the exact same songs, the exact same recordings. And he just flipped out. I love it. This and that. Oh, I got to get you with my writers. And the thing, it made me so angry. Uh, but the thing that I realized is, you know, oftentimes I think people in the music industry, their, their favorite word to say is no until someone else has validated something for them. Right. That's exactly right. And yet there's an old joke that, you know, there's a, a A&R person that there's a, a songwriter playing them a song in their office and, they they come out and they said, "Well, was the song any good?" And he said, "I don't know. I'm the first to hear it." Yeah, I, I have. A, I have <laughs> That's a, true. I I know a particular artist who's actually a you know pretty pretty well known artist now, um, and uh, and he and his manager they had a meeting with a record label uh, down on Music Row. I I I forgot the specific details, but it was basically you know like they met with them at one o'clock. And, and the guy at the label, the A&R guy, was basically just saying, like, you know, how, you know, they're going to pass and this and that and 
whatever. And his manager just said, that, that's great. You know, we, we already agreed to this meeting. So we wanted to show up, but uh, you know, at two o'clock we're actually meeting with, you know, so-and-so down the street at a different label because they're signing him. Mm-hmm. And so we're signing with them at two o'clock. It was, it was total fabrication, right? But they did not even get out of the building before he had a contract in his hand because that validated that artist to that particular A&R guy and he wasn't going to let him go, right? Oh, yeah. So he signed him on the spot. And it was, it was yeah. a total lie. <laughs> I'll tell you, he's had a great something- career, by the way. He's had a fantastic career. <laughs> Something funny, funny that I did uh, uh, on a on a lower level, on a songwriter level, was uh, I was I was supposed to meet with this uh, with Warner Brothers, uh, and I was uh, I would you know start I was getting some getting a bunch of cuts then uh, cut after cut, and I was meeting with Warner Brothers to you know uh, to see if they would sign me, and I told them I was I was talking to other people, and I was. But I was was going to this meeting, and I, but I was at BMG talking to a friend of mine, David Lee, and uh, we we were actually riding that day. That's right. So we were riding that day at BMG, which I, I wasn't talking to. So I said, I got to go. I got to go to this meeting. And I, as I was going by the the desk, they had these hats. They had these BMG Chrysalis publishing hats. And I said, can I have one of those hats? And they said, yeah, sure. So I put that BMG hat on (laughs) and I went to my Warner Brothers meeting and and he comes in and I walk in and I sit down and he said, well, I see who you're talking to, uh, who the other person you're talking to is. And I was like, what, what are you talking about? He goes, the hat. I was like, oh, I forgot I had that on. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> because amazing. you got to take that hat off. So I took the hat off and I, I ended up writing for Warner Brothers. But <laughs> I swear, I think that hat got me the deal, though. The <laughs> I, there's definitely a lot of strategy like that yeah. involved. And not in a manipulative way, but it, it's, it is more of a human nature aspect. It is. You know? Yeah. Um, people are, people are more averse to losing something than gaining something. And so if, if someone's in a position to sign someone, they might not sign them, but if they're in a position to lose the opportunity to sign them, they might sign them. Right. Yeah. And here's the thing. A lot of people you'll see, you know, you'll talk to some writers and say, yeah, well, I, you know, you'll hear, well, they're just not signing right now. That is not true. They're, they're, not, they're just not signing that person right now because they, uh, publishing companies, they can't afford to pass up a, like a Craig, a, a, a big, the next big songwriter. They're, I mean, they're always looking for something like that. The, you know who, who's who's coming up and who they think's really going to hit big. They you know it's it's just a it's a game of like you said of 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 just you know trying to figure out who's going to because it's about the bottom line. It's about how how much money do they think they're going to make from you? Right. That's yeah. it comes down to that. I mean, it shouldn't be. I mean, it should be about great songs. It should be about but it, you know, it, it's, it's just the game. They have to keep the lights on and, and the people employed. Exactly we, have, right. we have a time for one more question. And this is a, something I, I would love for you to talk about. Um, you know, when you're, cause country market is, is a little different obviously than, than the pop. Yeah. Market. <clears throat> when you are pitching your songs, when you're delivering your songs to your publisher and your publisher is pitching them to an artist, what is the level of production that those songs are at? I, I have, I have this thing that I I call smaller all, and I never go in between. I, I, if it's, you know, if it's a great ballad, if it's, you know, I think especially ballads, if it has a great, um, 
you know, lyrics and, and a great melody, if you can really make it come off with an acoustic or, or, or something else, and it's just, you know, maybe, maybe one accompaniment, I, I think that's fine, or you go all the way. And you go in and you actually spend the money on great musicians to make it sound like what you, what, you know, where they, they don't have to use imagination. But what happens is, is, uh, you know, the real, on the, on the, the smaller side, they can use their imagination to, um, to see, you know, they can hear fills and, and say, man, I can hear what this song could be. In, anywhere in between, in my opinion, it could veer them off. If you if you do a if you do a two hundred dollar demo where you just have you know C players come in and just you know it it can veer them off of where that they think that song should be and so I, I'm always you know either do go really low key with it or go all out. I, you know, because, and, and if you do, you know, there's nothing wrong with having a demo, that, especially if you, if you know great players that can do it for cheaper, that's fine. When, when I say $200 demo, I just mean. You're, you're, you're giving an overall know, generalization of the quality. If it's a $200 yeah. demo, by the time you hire an engineer and musicians, everyone needs to get paid a, a fair wage. Exactly. And you're, and you're, it, you're essentially saying that you're hiring people who don't value what they do. Exactly. Yeah. And, and you have to remember, too, A&R people listen to top-notch, master-quality demos all day. Like our, a demo now, I mean, uh, you know, you're talking a, a, you're talking a thousand bucks for a demo now, and or more. So you, and that's what they're listening to all day. If you pop in a, mo, you know, a, a, a demo that has, you know, the dr fake drums, you can hear that's fake. <laughs> You know, there's a difference. Oh yeah, and absolutely. and and uh, and it's just some. You know, you can't. You can barely hear the vocal, and and, and there's just a hum or there or whatever it is. They're gonna know instantly, and that that's gonna be a subpar demo. I had a good and, friend of mine. I had a good friend of mine who was A and R at Universal uh you know years ago and he really instilled on me one word he said bulletproof you want to make it bulletproof when you're delivering your song you want to make it bulletproof you don't want to give them any any reason or any excuse not to work with you or, or use your music you know unless they just really just don't like the song but you don't right, want yeah. to be like, oh, you know, with the vocals out of tune or all oh, the good, the drums sound like they're programmed from 1985. You know, yeah. any least thing like that that can be easily tweaked and fixed, you make it bulletproof. Yeah, exactly. And, and the thing about it is, is it, any, and there's a whole thing to, uh, I see a lot of new songwriters that their mixes, like the vocal is way down, especially. Uh, I do a different mix. If I'm going to do a, um, and you know, a thing for me, for my album, that's a different mix than if I'm doing a demo because a demo, you have to take, you have to take away every instance that they can hit stop or pause. If you, if, if they have to hit pause and say, now, what did you say right there? You might as well go to the next song. Yeah. And, uh, and there's so many engineers that want you to hear what they do. So they want the, that magical mix to hear for someone to hear what they do, but you're not pitching them. You're pitching your song and you have, they have to hear what the song's saying and the most important parts of that song 
or it, or you might as well, like I said, you might as well go to the next one. Yeah, yeah. There's and, I, I've I've pretty much tried to remove the word demo from my vocabulary. You know, in in, in the licensing yeah. world, even though I often you know don't do multiple recordings of a song, meaning I don't write it and record it and then go back and record it again and then go back and record it yeah. again. <clears throat> my process is. I, I, I record it. I record it once. Now through the process, I will replace things and I'll keep making it better. But uh, like I might start with program drums, and as after I add things, I'll hand it off or I'll send it off to a buddy of mine who will then replay the program drums with real drums so I can capture right. the real human element. But that's not a separate recording. Then maybe I'll go back and redo the guitars to match the power of the drums or whatever. But I'm yeah. really building it up within that one system because I don't look at it as I'm doing a demo. I never do demos. Demos don't exist anymore and there's no reason for them to because we right. all have the power to make great sounding recordings either yeah. in our home studios for a very little investment in, in the gear and in the time learning or in your case, you know, uh, working with uh, A-list musicians and engineers for $1,000 or $1,200 or, or whatever because you're creating a product that has the potential to bring in hundreds of thousands of dollars in the long run. Yeah. And, um, you know, back, back in the day, um, you know, when, when, when I was, I'm doing my own thing now, but when I was with publishers, a lot of people don't realize too, is the publishers own the masters to all those demos. Mm -hmm. So I, I think publishers are, are kind of missing the boat on using those demos for other things. Right. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. There's that. I think so, some, it, it might not be the case necessarily in Nashville yet. I think especially uh, when it comes to like the licensing world, but in, in a lot of the mainstream stuff, a lot of publishers are, uh, you know, the, a lot of publishers in, in the mainstream world, I say mainstream, I'm always thinking like along the lines of like the pop market or whatever. Right. They, they are monetizing the master in, in, in the world of sync. But I definitely agree with you. The, the country market seems to be a bit behind on that. And, and yeah. a lot of it, it's just simply because, you know, when you're in California, you're in that world because it, it's, it's all around you. Here, here it's not so much, and here the, the, the focus is a little different. But I would love right. for you also to, um, you know, as we wrap up, I would love for you to share with everyone what you're doing now and what you're working on. Well, um, I am currently creating an online course uh, online songwriting course called building great songs and uh, it's something i've been wanting to do for a long time and and you know because of you know covid and everything I, i've had more time to 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 really sink my teeth into it but you can go to buildinggreatsongs.com and uh you can download free uh, a uh, you know top it was a uh, top 10 biggest mistakes new songwriters make yeah. and, and there's a couple other things that you can get there and uh, and i'm really excited about some of the things that are going to make it on to this to this course and i'm going to have um interviews with huge people in the industry music execs to uh, hall of fame songwriters that's going to be part of it as well and you know, I, I dive into a lot of things that I don't see a lot of people talking about. One of the things that I love about the online, getting online, uh, you know, obviously, you know, online, you have to, you have to look at the people who are teaching you online. There are, there are you know, yeah. real, there are people who are <laughs> teaching stuff online who haven't done anything in, in their career. And then there are other people who have reached certain levels in their career and, and they, they've been teaching it to other people along the way anyway, right? I, I was teaching, I've been teaching licensing to my friends and other people that I knew really since, you know, 2007, 2008, right. uh, you know, in, in my small little circle. And then there was another individual who came in and said, you know, you can really show this to a lot of people who don't, you know, who you're not in contact with every day. And I have to say that it is the most fulfilling thing that I've done to be able to, to see other people take the process that I have and have success with it and they start getting licenses right before I, I talked to you today I talked to someone who's in my course who's done uh, uh, almost 30 commercials and I asked him I said what's the range that you're doing he said oh it's between you know five thousand and fifty thousand dollars 
And and I think that's incredible. That's, that's incredible. Amazing. He took my program, and now this is what he's doing with his life. And that's a that's 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 good. That's good income, right? But same thing with you. You know, uh, to be able to to learn from from you, you have a lot of experience. You're an expert in it. Obviously, you have a lot of stories and a lot of strategies to share of how you've navigated the industry. But even going s- steps further than that, beyond just the 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 teaching of what you're going to get. And it's the same thing in my world too. Uh, mm-hmm. You're going to, you're going to bring in other experts like what I'm doing with you, right? Yes. I'm sharing you with, 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 with my, with the room musicians don't starve podcast, you know, listeners. And, and you're going to bring in people in your world who the songwriters who come to you, they're, they're going to know who they are. They're going to know the songs that they've written and what an incredible value this is. And I really think that the future of, of education is learning online from experts who've done it as opposed to going to a school and learning from a teacher who's given a curriculum that they have to teach because that's what their boss told them. They have to, they, they have to teach a, a class on sync licensing, but they've never licensed a song. So they read this curriculum and they teach it to students. And, and that's, that, that really is, drove me to do this because I see so many people online and, and uh, that, and I, I actually put, you'll, you'll see this in my, I just put this on my page. You would never go to a mechanic that has never successfully fixed a car. Why would you do that with the craft of songwriting? Uh, you know, and, and, and people, there's so many people on there that are, are, are saying things that I know for a fact is not the way to do it and it isn't true and it really it really kind of uh pushed me to make this you know to make this course because i really want people to know how it really works Mm -hmm. and uh you know and 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 to kind of give access to and i you know as music people we a lot of times we kind of shut ourselves off to you know uh from 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 people and we kind of concentrate on our art and what I want to do with this course, I'm also offering, you know, uh, mentoring, uh, video mentoring sessions and, uh, and written song critiques as well. And it's just, you know, it's just something different for me. It, it's, it's a, it's kind of a different world for me, but, uh, but I'm really, really enjoying it so far. And, and I'm, I'm going to, going to be launching it pretty soon. And I, I'm, you know, I've got a, I'm, I'm given a deal. It's two hundred dollars off of my course before you know before I launch it. Right. So uh, people would be getting a, just an amazing deal if they uh, are one of the founders. Right. And I also wanted to mention that I do a podcast as well with a buddy of mine. I do. Uh, if you anywhere you listen to podcasts, look for Marty Ray Project Chats. And I'm a co-host with it with my buddy, Marty Ray. Marty has 1.3 million followers online and he has over 200 million views. Very talented guy, but him and I talk to a bunch of people on our podcast as well. And, um, everybody from MMA fighters to huge stars, you know? So, uh, I would tell everybody to look up Marty Ray project chats as well. If you're, if you're a songwriter, go, go follow the links. If you're watching this on, on video, uh, I'll, I'll obviously have the links below as well. Chris, I, the, I, 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 have, I was going to tell you too. It's the Chris Wallen at every, every social media. Just look for whatever social media it is, the Chris Wallen and I'll be there. Awesome. Well, thanks for, for joining us. I, I always love to end every episode with the Real Musicians Don't Starve manifesto, and that is, real musicians are business owners, and our business is music. Now, business is simply an organization where value is provided in order to make a profit. And unlike starving musicians who operate with a mindset of scarcity, fear, and scarcity and fear, I'm sorry, as success-driven musicians, we operate with a mindset of abundance, confidence, and service. We are doers, we are dreamers, we are creators, and we are achievers. We know that our true value is determined by how many people we serve and how well we serve them because our truth is that real musicians don't starve. So, so true. Thank you. So Chris, I, I, 
I've enjoyed talking with you. Then I, I enjoyed uh, everything you had to share and, and the stories. And we need to do this again because you need to, Man, you need to I would share love the it. story of, uh, of hanging out with Kid Rock and, and Billy Gibbons that you were sharing. Oh, my gosh, before. yeah. There, there's a whole other story, too, about me uh, uh, freezing 29-cent McDonald's hamburgers when I came to town. It's kind of crazy, too. The, the, the we'll things get, we'll that we do it. to pursue music, especially <laughs> when we're starving, is, is pretty amazing, right? But, you know, yeah. that's what makes – I, we all have to go through that. You know, you, you say the freezing, you know, the, the, the burgers, I, I, I did, <laughs> I did the ramen noodles and, and, yeah. I, and, uh, you know, and I lived in a two bedroom apartment with, uh, you know, four other guys and three of them had girlfriends. And I mean, one night I remember I counted, I think 11 people sleeping in that place. I lived there for oh, like eight months. And, uh, you know, the things we do to, to, to go after our goals and achieve our dreams, but, but, you know, it just makes it so much better when we can look back on it, especially where we're at now, and I, I wouldn't give up any of that. I, I loved every no. minute of it, even the worst moments of it. I look back and I go, I'm so thankful for all of it. They say behind every successful musician is an astonished mother-in-law. <laughs> That's amazing. Probably true. Probably true. Well, Chris, thank you so much for hanging out with thank us. Thank you so much will- for having me, Michael. Awesome. We will talk to you guys in the next episode.